Covering music-related content of all genres, if it filters through Eastern Texas, it's fair game. Y'all bring it. From Texarkana down to the coast and Dallas down to Houston and everything in between, we are E-T-X Ross! <laughs> Hello, y'all, and welcome to a brand new episode of ETX Rocks, hosted by yours truly, Boston Chris. This week, we have a lifetime musician by the name of Red Leone, a pedal steel guitar player out of Golden, Texas, who has almost 60 years in the, in the music business. But before we get to our conversation with Red, this week's podcast is brought to you by Becky's Karaoke Crazy. Becky's Karaoke Crazy can be found in Kilgore on Highway 31, right there by Highway 42, each and every Wednesday night. So if you need to get karaoke crazy, make sure you check out Becky's Karaoke Crazy, Wednesday nights on Highway 31 in Kilgore. So Red Leone, say hi. Hello. Introduce yourself. I'm Red Leone, um, live in Golden, Texas. Uh, anything else you might want to help me uh, well, <laughs> hit with? Well, uh, you're, you're how old now? I'm 81. You just yes. turned 81 yesterday, June the right? 4th, yesterday. We had a big party down here in Houston at the Carriage House. Yeah. You played with a bunch of Hall of Famers. Yes. How was that? It, that was a great, won't forget it. You had a lot of fun. I had plenty of fun. Buddy Ferguson, uh, Mark Dessens, and uh, Dusty Carroll, friends from years ago, and we had a real good time there. And these guys are Western Swing Hall of Famers. Yes. Buddy Ferguson's in six different Hall of Fames. I was reading about him yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, y'all let me get up and sing. That was really cool. I appreciate that. Um, uh, let, tell me something, Red. How did you get started in the music business? How old were you? And, and how did all that start? Well, I was uh, raised over in, um, uh, out of uh, Zavala, Louisiana, in a community called Blue Lake. I went to school at a community called Ebarb. Finished school there. Uh, in my younger days, probably around 10, 11, 12 years old, something like that. I can't remember exactly. But uh, all my family and cousins were musicians. They played, sat on the front porch of the fiddles and the guitars and the mandolin and and uh, they'd play music, bluegrass more, more mostly. And I learned to play the guitar from my cousins. My dad was a good fiddler. He also taught me a lot about the fiddle and the guitar. He even tuned one up as a Hawaiian guitar, he called it. <laughs> and I started that, and that's what got me interested in uh, playing that, uh, the dobro or that type of uh, guitar, because it's a lot easier on the fingers. I couldn't play the fiddle because my little finger would not be in right and on the, on the noting part of it. so. I gave that up and just stuck with the dobro. So you started with the dobro and, and kind of uh, transferred over to, to your main instrument, which is what now? It's a double neck Blanton uh, steel guitar. Um, the way I got my first uh, electric steel guitar, my dad called it electric Hawaiian guitar. Is uh, I think it's a year around 49, somewhere in there that Leon McCullough came out with the um, panhandle rag and it and I heard it on the radio but we had a battery style radio so we didn't get to listen a whole lot to it so I'd get little parts of it from time to time it took me probably about two months to learn it but uh, my dad came in and heard me trying to play it and he told me son you learn to play the panhandle rag and I'll get you a real electric Hawaiian guitar <laughs> so after that, my mom had a hard time getting me to do my chores because I was with that guitar sitting down trying to perfect it so my dad would get me that guitar. And he did. He brought it in to me. And we, did, we didn't have electricity at, at that time. So we, um, uh, I would go up to my uncle's house, which was about five miles away from us. They, they had electricity. And we could plug the little amplifier in and plug the steel guitar in. And that's that's... That's how I get to play it electrically. But at home, I would set it. I would set the guitar on a foot tub to get some resig resignation, mm -hmm. and that's how I, I I learned. So back in this back in this time, we're talking mid to late forties, and you weren't you weren't blessed in a, in a family that was able to afford you know things that we love and take for granted today, like 
electricity and indoor plumbing and things like that. So tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in that kind of era and, 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 and being in that kind of household. Well, I didn't think it so bad at the time because all the people around us was in the same shape. We didn't know we were poor right. because we had plenty to eat. We farmed. Um, and as I say, we didn't realize that we didn't have things until we went to town and went to somebody's house in town that might have indoor plumbing and electricity. But uh, at the time, it didn't seem hard, uh, and now it would be hard. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I couldn't so do So, like, a little thing like a battery-operated radio was, yeah. a, was a huge difference in, yeah, your, in your childhood. Going, yeah, going to the bathroom away, apart from the house to the outhouse. Right. Uh, so, so, basically, if it wasn't for, you know, your cousins and your family being kind of musically gifted, you wouldn't have never really been exposed to music. Wouldn't have been for that? No, I wouldn't have. But I caught on real fast. Um, um, it didn't take long to learn how to learn chords on the guitar that my cousins weren't, weren't, a, weren't uh, didn't use. And uh, I, I don't know, for some reason, it just seemed to be a knack for me to pick all that up. And when I started playing the dobro, I just got to walk and play anything that I could whistle or hum. Um, I went, did, you, did you write a lot of music as a youngster? Or? No, at that, I didn't. I didn't, I wasn't into that. Uh, in high school, I did write some songs. My uh, classmates helped me write some songs, but the, uh, only one got recorded, and it was out of Shreveport with a guy, and I can't remember his name now. I played music with him. Sonny, oh golly, Sonny Hall, I believe. It's a long time ago, uh, but it never done anything. Uh, I got one copy of it, and I don't remember what happened to the rest of it. Um, but when I finished high school in 1955, uh, I had played in Houston, though, with a group the year before for the summer vacation, and I went back and finished high school. Oh, in the meantime, before then, uh, I did some auditioning in Shreveport, Louisiana, Kate of a Cage for, I think it was Red Savine was looking for a steel player, but another guy done beat me to it. But as I was in the studio, I met um, Farron Young. And he showed uh, on some interest, so I did play a few high school uh, shows with him. Back in those days, uh, they didn't play in the clubs. They went out to the high schools and did a show. And I did play uh, two or three, I can't remember exactly. And he he told me, he said, well, I'm fixing to go to Nashville. I'd like to take you with me. And I'd have had to quit school, so my dad now told me, son, you can always go to Nashville. That's you right. Can't, you can't. You can't. Uh, you get that. Idea. Your education is what you need. So I made uh, made a decision not to do that. And so that was the first time in your life where a decision had popped yes. up in your life where you had to make a decision between something important to you and something else that was important to you. Uh, in this case, it was it, it was between school and music. Of course, like today, Nashville was huge back then as well. Uh, you know, a lot of people in the yeah. South, Midwest, things like that. Um, Nashville was the place to be if you wanted to get noticed, right? Yeah, and I'd heard, too, that there was a lot of musicians in Nashville uh, sleeping in their cars. So they, everybody everybody did not did not make it up there. So, uh, right. you know, me, I, I, I was a learning steel guitar player, and I I thought about it, too, that, man, I'm, I don't know as much as the other guys do, so I may not make it there. Right. But I mean, being a school age child at this point, you're you're already getting noticed by professional entertainers and things like that. That had to be pretty exciting for you as a as a teenager, right? Yeah, and and around my part of the country, over in Louisiana, there wasn't there was a few guys that played steel guitar. Uh, Felton Pruitt played with Hank Williams for a few years. He was about I lived in Florine, Louisiana. Uh, can't remember the other guy's name. He played up there with some of the big shots too. And I just never felt in their category, and so I've always kind of knew my lim my limits on what I could do, what I was capable of doing, and what I couldn't do. But I was learning all the time. I went to uh, I came down to Houston, played one summer, and went back to finish my year in high school. And the night I graduated, it was a band that my cousin was in. The guys came and got me, and I left the night I finished high school. Went to Houston, and of course it was in the clubs. The very night. The very and night you graduated, you, you hit the road. Yes, sir. Wow, that's that's pretty interesting. And started playing with that group down there, and that's, that's just started all, playing the club scene. Yes, and that, okay. it all just 
from there it spiraled into me playing uh, up and through the, uh, except for the two years I was in his service uh, in the Army, uh, I played nightclubs up till then. After I got out of the Army, I didn't play many nightclubs anymore because I got with a group that was only playing private parties. And I made about three times the money, and they fed you good at those private parties. So <laughs> I bet they did. Could, couldn't hardly drag me back into a club. So you started playing at how old? At the steel guitar or the dobro, probably at about 13. I started playing the electric steel guitar when I was 14, I can remember. So you're, we're, we're talking 58 years Yeah. that you've been a, a musician. Been here a long time. 58 years. There's not too many folks around that can say they've been in the business that long. Um, can you name name a few folks that people might be in um, might recognize that you played with or or uh, opened for or, or whatever it may be? Yeah, well, most of the people that I played in, in uh, name people there, Jackie Ward. I don't know if he, I don't know where he is now. Jackie Ward. Um, oh gosh, my mind goes blank on some of these things. Um, Oh yeah, I was playing with a, a group called uh, the Village Boys in Houston, and uh, Bob Wills came through touring. And just he was he was uh, along with um, didn't have a big band, so we backed him up. He had Tag Lambert as his uh, guitarist that traveled with him, and we did two shows with him in Houston. And a lot of and people said, "Why King of Western Swing?" Yeah, yeah, why didn't why didn't you guys get some pictures or something? I said, "Well, at the time, I didn't think it was that important." Well, they didn't have digital photography back no, then either, didn't. right? <laughs> no, they didn't, and uh, I never was one to care about being in the limelight anyhow, so, I mean, it, it wasn't that important to me. Well, that's but, cool. So, Bob Wills, anybody else that we might recognize? Jackie Ward was a was a pretty uh, um, known person back then with Big, Big Blue Diamond. I played with him, I think, for about a year. Is this all a western swing and bluegrass type artist? Yeah, country, country, country and west. We played a pretty good variety. Uh, the other boy, the, the other guy that I came to Houston with was Joey Long. Okay. He was a he was about a third cousin, a second cousin, something like that. And uh, he got up into into the blues, played with Johnny Rivers and done some stuff on his own. Sonny Fisher was another one. He went. Uh, he went to Europe and made it good over there, and um, golly, I'm trying to think of somebody else. I, I can't, right now, my mind is not working that way. Well, that's okay. It. We can go back to kind of talk about, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, Leona Williams. I, I, uh, I was working Leona. with Neil Hart. Neil Hart, I played with Neil Hart about 16 years in uh, uh, Pure Country, the name of the band. Uh, Neil done some stuff stuff and he was on radio on several jamborees but I wasn't with him on those jamborees um, as before my time uh, we we opened for uh, Leona Williams and trying to think of some more people I pick with and that boy it just comes kind of hard coming by and remembering stuff because I think I got that some timers <laughs> So you get out of high school, you, you immediately that night graduate, you, you head to Houston. Yes, sir. And you said you uh, you spent a couple of years in the service, so uh, when did that happen? That was 1958. Uh, I was drafted in 1958, February. Uh, Elvis was drafted the same month, but I got a deferment because uh, at that time my uh, wife was pregnant, well, first child. and. I got a deferment, so I didn't have to go in until uh, April. April of so Elvis, Elvis 59? Quick, huh? April of 59? April of 58. 58, okay. Yeah, Elvis was a couple of months ahead of me. And the strange thing is, when I got to um, Fort Hood, I did my basic training there. And an, uh, and Elvis was um, uh, next, right next door to us. We were in kind of new barracks that had second and third floors. I was on the second floor. Elvis' uh, unit was across the street from us in the old type uh, wooden barracks, uh, shotgun type looking places. And Where was this located? In Fort Hood, Texas. Okay. And I got to see him there twice. Once he was on KP. Uh, of all of all the things they had him doing to cleaning trash cans, keeping the <laughs> garbage cans cleaned up and 
they had on Saturday they had a, some girls came in with a photographer they were taking portraits of us and I guess that's for the computers so they had to have somebody do the paperwork and I don't know if they were high school or college I don't remember exactly but uh, come noontime the girls had a chance to go to the mess hall first and get get uh, get their lunch and we, so the rest of us stay in the barracks waiting for our term and uh, somebody said hey look at here you heard some hollering I'm going outside some women hollering and they were running across the street and as we looked out the window over there this uh, the mess sergeant was getting Elvis and another guy dragging them inside and they locked the door them girls are surrounding that building there. It looked like they were trying to climb the walls to look in the windows. <laughs> they finally got them back over. That that, that encounter, the only time I'd seen him, you know, uh, he got to live off base because of his mom. And he had two or three guys he'd bring to work with him. He had a big purple-looking uh, Lincoln, big car. And he lived across the road from where uh, my wife and I lived. Uh, in a trailer park we lived in a trailer park and, and he came off that road morning morning i was going to the base and boy he came off that road on the other side throwing rocks because i think they were running late and uh of course i i was a little later getting to the uh to the road so he got ahead of us but he was slinging rocks everywhere it is and i knew it because of the car and my wife had got to meet elvis's dad in a grocery store and then uh i got I understand, I understand there's a story about how, uh, I guess, Elvis saluted you or something like that. Even though you two months in, you know, longer than him, apparently he thought you had all this seniority over him. No. Tell us about that. No. Well, we were on a train, and uh, he was in the Army outfit in Germany. Right. And uh, tanks, mortar platoons, and stuff like that. He was in headquarters battery, and he uh, headquarters company there, I think. I was in the artillery in headquarters battery. They needed umpires at the training um, at Vilsick, Second Field. Vilsick, I believe it was. It's hard to remember, you know, 50 years back. Uh, they were, we were an umpire team, so we had to run around the place out there and kind of uh, make sure they was um, tac tactical, like they had the, the equipment all camouflaged and everybody's trying to be in invisible. Right. Uh, and uh, they were, but uh, one, one Saturday, uh, the, uh, one guy, I was, uh, I was a Jeep driver, and one of the other boys, he, we were both PFCs, we got, we decided to go out and do a little sightseeing, but we had our hats on and our white bands running and run our white band up on the uh, Jeep so they would know we was umpire team. Uh, well, we was coming by this one unit, and we saw these guys standing around, uh, and, uh, they had some trucks there and jeeps there and uh, just a couple of guys just wiping down the jeep and the other guys in the middle around doing something. As we drove by, we was probably maybe a hundred feet from them at the time. And um, they, so when we started, as we drove up, somebody called attention. Mm -hmm. And we was wondering, they all stood up there and saluted us. I, so Teresa <laughs> says, Got to look around behind him and see if there's an officer behind us. Right. There wasn't nobody there, so he just kind of slunts down. He was slunched. He just kind of gave him a salute back, you know, and we drove on by. He said, that's Elvis. Look at that Jeep over there. We could tell by the markings on the bumpers, right. but, you know. And we got back to the unit. We was telling the guys about that. Now, all the officers told us the reasons. He just bought a brand-new field jacket, didn't, uh, and he had the, he had the little... Uh, uh, they called them power caps back then. This was in his 60s, I think, or 59 or 60. And only officers got the ones that had the fur on on the bill of it. Right. Uh, but Cerise happened to get one. Well, he put his uh, battalion insignia on the flaps of his jacket and on his power cap. Well, from a distance, uh, what's that guy, half guy, half man, half horse? Centaur. Uh, centaur. Uh, that was our our battalion insignia, but from a distance it could have looked like a major, right? You know, yeah, because it was gold and shiny, and the reason the way he was slumped down there like a, I'm not saying all officers did that, but they usually pretty relaxed, <laughs> right? Yeah, and our officer told us told Cerise, Cerise, you like being a private? 
because they've been having he didn't have his his stripes on them. He said he said I'm gonna give you to the end of the day if you don't have stripes on that jacket. He said I'm gonna bust you down to a private. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the reason Sharice looked like an officer in that right. jeep. So we had a big big fun out. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for your service, Red, and thank you well, very much for. Well, I, I appreciate I appreciate that, and I, you know, as I come out and I hear people tell me that, but I thank them for their service too, because everybody has a service. And, and especially the people at the at the hospital, at the VA hospital, the people that work there. I've been I've been there so much. I've encountered a lot of people in administration and medical staff. It's so wonderful there. Right. And they've always treated me good. So tell me something. I, I know you're a, a huge family man. You, you're married you, for I guess what 39 years. Going on 40. Going on 40 years married, uh, four children. And almost 60 year music career. Yeah. So how 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 were you able to find that balance in between your music career, your family life, and also of course being a, a huge lover and faithful with Jesus Christ? How how do you find that, that balance? Well, I did I, I didn't meet the, I didn't meet Jesus until um, 19 and uh, 78 or 79. I think it was 79. No, I think my youngest daughter was a was a baby then, so it had to be in eighty around eighty two, or some after that. Uh, but as far as playing music, I had already quit playing, quit drinking, and quit playing the nightclubs, not because of my uh, Christian uh, uh, beliefs. beliefs and stuff like that. It was because it's, the beer started giving me headaches, bad headaches, and it took too long to get old, and it didn't take long to get weaned off the beer. But uh, I I started playing at that time. I wasn't in the club, so I was in the private party, playing most of the private parties then. Um, but uh, I balanced it in a way that I could take my kids. I wouldn't play in clubs anyhow because I could take my children with me to the to the uh, event. Uh, you know the events that was happening in like your shows. Uh, yeah, my shows like there were anniversaries or wedding receptions, parties, and so you always like kind that. of wanted to have your kids with you to, to in, it was, in, experience the same things you were. Yeah, it was very important to me, family. So I would not, I, I, I would not play at a place where I couldn't carry my, my family with me. Wow, and how how did that how how has that decision uh, affected your career? It didn't affect it any because I played a lot. I mean, I was booked almost all the time you know right. and and I never never went without having some venue to play you know, but I'd stay with a band for years once I got with one and I also uh, uh, had to travel quite a bit uh, during the time I was with that band uh, out of Columbus Daryl Apple which is uh, he still got a group called the hitman he's down in Columbus he's on a uh, I can't remember the Call letters of the radio stage of DJ down there in Columbus. So, what is it? K U L M M. Daryl, if you hear this, buddy, <laughs> appreciate your time and your friendship. Well, let me ask you this, Red. Um, I know that you know being a musician for 58 years, um, and, I, and you've told me that you know you you pretty much played East Texas. He's been on the road once or twice, but mostly it's East Texas, Central Texas, South, Southeast Texas. I never really made it out of this area. So how do you how do you continue to have that passion for music, even though it's not really going to the next level? I mean, how, you know what I mean? Well, I, I love to play. And it's just one of those things that I always had a desire to do ever since I got to hearing my cousins play, I had that desire that was real strong, and it still is. Um, I play with groups around um, the, the uh, Mineola area, uh, senior citizen dances, I love to play for them. And uh, But one thing I want to get back to, if you don't mind, is, is sure. my decision, my decisions I made in my life, and uh, uh, the good decisions were the first one I don't know if I told you this or not. Can't remember. But I I trusted Christ for my salvation. 
Yes, sir. The best decision. The next best decision was is meeting and marrying my wife and raising a beautiful family. So uh, family's always been important to me and still is. I got some lovely grandchildren. And, uh, oh, it's, it's just wonderful. Like arrows in my quiver. But uh, I play around East Texas, uh, Lindale, uh, Arbela, Canton, uh, down at Seven Point. And, but I'm trying to start a group of my own. You still got that passion. You still, oh, yes. still love making the music. I love making music, and my uh, my first choice is classic country and and we, uh, western swing. I'm real into western swing, and I will play some of that shaky booty stuff too. <laughs> you, you almost have to. But uh, I'm going to get this group together, and I uh, think we found a venue in Lindale. What's uh, that We're working on that. We're going to call that, uh, if, if the guy let me, it's his building. But if he'll let me, I'm going to call it Sweet Cedar Project. My group is going to be called Sweet Cedar. And I don't know why I like that name. It's just something that just jumps in my head and won't go away. But I've got, I've got a couple of people that's committed, and I'm looking for two more that has the same thought of the same mind about the music we want to oh, play and have look, a passion for it. What are you looking for? We're looking to people that can play western swing, classic country, and southern gospel. Does it matter what instruments? Yes. Uh, yeah, well, we have drums. I have drums. Uh, the drummer is a lady in Lindale, Andrea Jordan, very good singer, good drummer, and uh, myself with a steel guitar. And I've been talking to a guy about the bass. Uh, if we can get him, he is, he is a great bass player. He's retired. He's played a lot of big bands. And uh, the girl drummer has too. I said girl drummer. She's a lady. Uh, very mature lady. So, and uh, the the building is in Lindale. It's a back to back. It's the back side of, um, or the other side, <laughs> north of Miranda Lambert's um, Pink pistol. Pink pistol, yes. Uh -huh. So are you looking for a guitarist or a fiddleist or? Yeah, violinist. I'd like to have a well fiddle. I'd rather call it fiddle. That okay. plays that kind of. I, I want people that play that has got a desire to do that kind of music. And right. If we do and if we think alike, then we're going to be good and get good and tight and uh, run this venue. We're going to. I don't think it'll be dancing. We want to do a opera style show, and bring in artists that is fairly well known to get it started off and bring in different even different bands well, i personally think that it's really cool at 81 years old that you're still trying to create new projects bring new music to um a, a kind of a i guess a, a, a portion of east texas that might be disappearing a little bit and you're, you're you've got that passion to try to bring that that back because you know there's so much history in east texas and south southeast texas central yes. texas with Western swing, country and Western bluegrass, there's a lot of history for those brands of music here, and it's really refreshing to see someone that's still passionate about those uh, brands of music and trying to keep them alive. Um, so that's hopefully the Sweet Cedar Project in uh, Lindale. Um, you can definitely come back to this podcast in the future, and if we get any new information on that we will definitely share that on a future podcast if you have interest in those kinds of music um red tell us about some of your favorite places to play throughout your career oh gosh man there's been a bunch of them and uh, uh of course my favorite place has been since the clubs um i played uh shows I love shows. I love dance music too, but the shows are the most most important to me, and uh, that's why I'm trying to get this started in Lindo because I think we're going to do mostly shows. And if they want to dance and got room, they can. You know, we take down the no dancing signs. So, uh, but as far as a favorite place, I really don't. I really don't have a favorite place because uh, all venues I've enjoyed them. So. We got, um, oh, yeah, I played Good Company Barbecue Place. Oh, I love that, too. It was back in Houston some some years back. Um, 
I played church. I'll tell you another thing I did. I played churches around the Mineola area, Wood County and down to Smith County, with a group called uh, Blue Monday. I don't know why they called it Blue Monday. I never was blue. But uh, we had a good group then, and we played a lot of gospel music. We played some uh, insurance of uh, meetings and played a lot of secular music too, but we tried to keep it down to, you know, it's less cheating. <laughs> You still play festivals and stuff like that. Festivals, too, right? yes. We played the Alba Fire. We opened for um, Casey Busgraves, her first uh, thing at Alba Fire. I played a, I played that festival three years in a row. But we're working with different groups now. Um, and also I played the Yamboree over in uh, Gilmer, too. Yeah. And that's every October. And you played that several years now, haven't you? Yeah, I think, I think about six years. Yeah. And... Oh Lord, they just sometimes it's hard to remember where you having, where you had most of your fun at. I, I bet that's the case. But I try to have fun on every one of them. If I can't, I might as well. well I know, you know. Yesterday, I've seen you play a few times now. Um, but yesterday, down there at the Carriage House in Houston, Texas. Oh, if we have any Houston listeners, thank you all for tuning in. But um, it was really cool to see you play yesterday because it was so apparent that you were having the time of your life. I know it was your birthday, so that probably had a little bit to do with it. And you had, you know, some of your old time friends playing uh, with you, and family and friends, and church family all in the oh, in the house. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great event. Um, if anybody's looking for a place with great food in the Houston area, the Carriage House is the place to be. A very cool venue, um, antiques and uh, old timey feel, kind of like a general store, general restaurant kind of feel. Um, like a museum. Yeah, it really is kind of like a museum. I know the kids were, you know, kind of looking around at stuff the whole time we were there. And uh, the Western Swing and Country and Western, y'all were playing yesterday, kind of fit the place, you know. It's like part of the walls almost. And know? they have a band, live band there every uh, second and fourth Friday. Every second and fourth Friday. Right. So if you're in the Houston area, make sure you check out the Carriage House. Um, and Red, is there anything that you want to say to your fans, your family, your friends, anybody that might be listening out there? Because we're going to wrap this up. So if there's anything you'd like to say, please do. Well, I, most of all, you know, I, I thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and His grace that I'm here today. Uh, my family, I thank everybody. I, I thank you, Chris, fine brother-in-law. A son-in-law. I'm sorry, brother-in-law. I don't want to get that wrong. Just don't call married, me late for dinner. Yeah, it's bad. Call me anything married else. Married to my baby daughter Louise, and uh, I just it's it. Most of all, I just got to thank God for everything. Uh, I've had such a wonderful time in my life. We've had ups and downs, but the most of them we've learned to trust in the Lord and just make them all be positive. We can make you know lemonade out of a lemon. And I just thank you for the time you've taken with me to talk to me, too, because I'm just digging back in my mind, which is not easy to do, and try to remember stuff. Well, you know, like I told you before we started recording, I think with the wealth of knowledge that you have and being a life, you know, career musician for so long, I think there's so much that you can teach other people, and um, especially with some of your unique decisions and always um, kind of taking the high road, never letting the music... Um, you know, take you away from your God or your family or your school yes. or, you know, the multiple different times that you've been tempted with that decision and you always picked what was more important to you and your music always took a back seat to that. I think that was always, you know, that's really refreshing. Um, I think younger musicians and even some of the, the folks here in East Texas that have made it in a way um, can definitely learn from that to always... Um, try to find the right way to balance you know the music's important sure but your family your god your your, your friends they're always going to come before and they always yeah. should it, it's a good way to balance it and uh, one thing i want to if you've got a little time uh, uh advice to uh young musicians absolutely if Go you ahead. have if you have the desire for it look for opportunity in the right places don't get bogged down in one thing if 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 if, if, if what you're doing, the venue you're doing or whatever you're doing is not working for you, seems like you're kind of boxed in and you won't experience something, you have to get out of that and go to it. And uh, it's always opportunity out there. I just wish there was more young people 
that's learning to play the steel guitar because uh, you know when I'm gone, <laughs> we got about three counties there. No, there is no young steel guitar players around, and uh, we do have a uh, East Texas Steel Guitar Association out of Tyler, and we meet the third Sunday of every month down at the um, on on Paluxy, right off of Paluxy on, on Simple Street at the W O W Woods of the World uh, Building. Uh, from I think it's from about one to about four, and we have awesome. a lot of good steel guitar players coming in, a lot of good fans coming in. So that's one thing to keep in mind, and just look for Sweet Cedar; it's going to be out there. And we will definitely update the folks out there, our listeners out there, on Sweet Cedar. And Red, we thank you for taking the time to talk with us here on ETX Rocks. And remember, folks out there, if you like local music, make sure you're supporting your local venues, your local bands, your local artists. Um, That $5 cover might seem like a lot of money, but it's not $40 at an arena, and you're going to be just as entertained either way. So remember to support local music, and ETX rocks. Covering music-related content of all genres, if it filters through Eastern Texas, it's fair game. Y'all, bring it. From Texarkana down to the coast, and Dallas down to Houston, and everything in between, we are... 